Resistant hypertension is defined as a failure to achieve blood pressure when a patient adheres to the maximum tolerant dose of three antihypertensive drugs. Uh, a small joke, something is wrong with a nation that spends billions on war and not a dime on children's health. And this is a serious cartoon, not a joke. Hypertension epidemiology is a very frightening epidemiology. Even I have hypertension, I do take two, three pills. Every 20 to 10 millimeter increase in blood pressure correlates with doubling of 10 year cardiovascular risk, risk of heart attack, risk of heart failure, kidney failure. And only half of all treated hypertensives are controlled by established BP targets. High prevalence affects one in three adults. And one billion people worldwide will increase to 1.66 billion people. In a simplistic uh, slide, renal sympathetic efferent nerves activity, where kidney is a recipient of sympathetic signals, the efferent nerves which go to the kidney, and the efferent nerves which go from the kidney to the brain, and that cycle affects insulin resistance, sleep disturbance, hypertrophy, arrhythmia, and obviously the commonest vasoconstriction. So let's understand on renal nerve anatomy. Renal nerves arise from T10 to L2. They arborize around the artery and lie within the dentitia. And for many years people used to do surgical hypertension treatments with surgical sympathectomy back in 1930s with excellent results in hypertension but very high morbidity. And these are some of the landmark trials of 1935. Uh, Dr. Gupta may remember back in 60s, 50s, people used to do this treatment. Now, if you look at anatomy of renal artery, the nerves, lumen, endothelium, and there have been catheters with electrodes and insulated arch wires which provide the ablation energy. So there are radio frequency wires, standard interventional technique, four to six two-minute treatments per artery through a specialized generator provided by Medtronic. It used to be Adrian Company, RD and Company, which Medtronic bought. So you put a catheter and this catheter gives ablation across the artery. What happens now? What happens is what you see here. Reduction in surrogates of efferent and efferent denervation. You are doing denervation. By denerving you reduce tissue norepinephrine levels, you reduce muscle sympathetic nerve activity, and total body norepinephrine spillover falls down. There's a reduction in BP. Histologic evidence shows that this renal nerve disruption does not cause long-term damage. An application of percutaneous energy source is very safe and does not harm. So about three years ago, a landmark trial first in men was done to do and evaluate this trial, followed by another trial. It was called Simplicity 1, Simplicity 2 in US, Europe, and the results were published first in Lancet and then in a very prominent, reputable magazine, Hypertension. And what they showed, that using this RF ablation, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure drops. And this is the degree of drop. And the drop starts actually about a six months to one year later. And the simplicity one, which has been well published, did show that in 38 minutes of procedural time, with a very low two patient complication, there was a significant reduction in systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, as compared with baseline. And the response was 89%. 11% patients didn't respond. The conclusion was that first in men trial demonstrated the reduction. Lancet then published phase two trial, Simplicity 2. In 24 centers, 106 patients randomized one to one. And they did show the same thing. In control, no change in blood pressure. In RDN, renal denervation therapy, 32% reduction, 12%. 32 points and 12 points reduction. So the conclusion in Lancet, this was the conclusion, that this therapy resulted in significant reduction in BP without major complication and is beneficial for patients with treatment-resistant essential hypertension. 
along with these trials, renal denervation, people started realizing that renal artery efferent, efferent system is involved in hyperinsulinemia and sympathetic drive. And by doing the denervation, three separate publications showed insulin resistance being diminished, insulin glucose levels rather diminished, and HB1AC level at six months becoming normalized with p-value. And this is a complex slide, but easily if you see fasting glucose, fasting insulin, fasting C-peptide and HOMA-IR, all diabetic or pre- or post-diabetic components were reduced. The summary of those trials was that renal denervation reduces fasting glucose, insulin C-peptide 2 or glucose, improves insulin sensitivity, reduces the rate of progression. Prospective trials are needed. An area which was dramatically been studied is obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea again is involved with hypertension, obesity, and there is significant airway obstruction related to sleep apnea during REM sleep. And uh, with the sympathetic ablation at the, nerve, at the renal level, people are realizing in two landmark small studies that sleep apnea was benefited. And apnea, hypopnea index at three to six months after denervation improved. Chronic heart failure, also by reducing the sympathetic drive, Study design, simplicity heart failure has been started in about 40 patients in five centers. The early data are positive. To conclude, as I am now short of time, to conclude, there are five questions I am raising. Will this therapy have a major impact on therapy of hypertension? The first question. The answer is yes, it will. This is a gentleman here who believes Wow, what a drug. No side effects so far. So, no drugs are there without side effects. Believe me. Second question. Will this result in new indications for renal denervation? The answer is yes, it will. It will help less severe hypertension, hypertension-related disorders, and disorders of sympathetic excess, including sleep apnea, heart failure, chronic kidney disease and cardiorenal syndrome. Second last question, will this initiate the development of new techniques for renal denervation? Obviously what I showed was one technique. Newer techniques are coming with specialized catheters, micro catheters, micro infusion catheters which infuse guanethidine to do the same thing which radio frequency does. And lastly, will this become a new field of minimal invasive therapies Answer is already yes. The catheter is approved in Europe to be used. There are workshops and people are using this therapy quite frequently. So to summarize my slide, renal denervation has been shown to reduce systemic sympathetic activation. It reduces heart failure. It induces LVH regression and remodeling. It improves renal function. It decreases arterial stiffness, reduces arrhythmia reduces hypertension for which it is being tried, reduces glucose tolerance, reduces insulin resistance, and improves sleep obstructive apnea. So this is one of those modalities which is now proven to help so many modalities that it will be a part and parcel of our intervention. And I'll show you a movie. The link between hypertension and hyperactivation of the sympathetic nervous system is well established. Renal sympathetic nerve signals, both those going into the kidney and those originating from the kidney, play a key role in driving this hyperactivation. 
Ardian's Simplicity Catheter System offers physicians a way to precisely target and deactivate renal nerves with controlled low-power RF energy delivery from the tip of the catheter through the artery walls to the surrounding renal nerves. This novel intervention is intended to reduce the level of sympathetic nervous system hyperactivity and lower blood pressure. Although this new procedure, termed renal denervation, or RDN, has its roots in surgical sympathectomy, modern technology has transformed the approach into a less invasive, more straightforward cath lab-based procedure. The Simplicity catheter system features two main components designed to work in concert to deliver safe, individually tailored treatments with maximum ease of use. The low-profile treatment catheter and the automated portable RF generator. The steerable Simplicity catheter is specifically designed for safe renal artery intervention. Six French compatible, it has ergonomic controls for rotation and flexing, along with a self-orienting tip for stable atraumatic vessel wall contact. The Simplicity Generator automatically controls each energy delivery, adjusting to the individual patient during the treatment via a proprietary algorithm. Hands-free pedal activation and built-in control mechanisms maximize safety and allow the physician to focus on the procedure rather than the equipment. The endovascular procedure is performed with no permanent implant. The catheter is simply advanced into the renal artery using standard interventional technique with rotation and flexing controls used to achieve optimal positioning. Following an initial two-minute ablation, the catheter is rotated and the treatment is repeated in a helical pattern at three to five additional locations along the artery. After both renal arteries are treated, the catheter is straightened and removed from the body. Patients recover quickly and can soon return to their daily living. The RDN procedure is designed with the goal of quieting the renal nerves, counteracting chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system, and providing a sustained reduction in both blood pressure and the level of systemically damaging neurohormones. The Simplicity Catheter System from Ardian, offering a new treatment alternative for patients with uncontrolled hypertension. So I'll end my slide with a small joke. The doctor telling the patient, best thing you can do is give up smoking, drinking and fried food. The patient says, what's the second best? And this will become the second best treatment. Because he doesn't want to quit smoking, doesn't want to quit drinking, doesn't want to quit taking fried food. He will also not take medicine. So send the patients to us and we'll ablate his uh, sympathetic system. Thank you very much everybody. So clinical issues, acute coronary syndrome is a major syndrome, major problem throughout the world. And in India, we Indians have highest incidence of coronary artery disease. We know that uh, young patients are coming to us and the main problem with SES is that in spite of best treatment, they continue to have recurrent ischemia with the use of even antiplatelet therapy, dual antiplatelet, PTC or CABG or even best secondary preventive measures. So clinical issue is that whether addition of anticoagulant like warfarin has already shown that if you add warfarin to antiplatelet, you can reduce the recurrent ischemic events but it increases bleeding. So whether newer molecules like epixaban, whether it can reduce major vascular event in SES. Just to recollect our pharmacology, this is a co coagulation cascade. When factor 9 and factor 8, activated factor 8 and 9 are acting on factor 10, then factor 10 is activated and that actually stimulates uh, prothrombin which is converted to thrombin and that it takes on fibrin agent to form a clot in form of fibrin. So this epixaban is direct 10A factor inhibitor and it is a competitive inhibitor which has half life of about 9 to 11 years, 9 to 11 hours and this is, this was the studied in APRES 2 trial which was published in NEJM. It was a multicenter randomized trial comprising of more than 7,000 patients of ACS with additional two risk factors for ischemic heart disease 
ischemic events rather and mean age was 67. Epixab and pyrimidine twice a day was compared with placebo and follow-up was for eight months. Primary endpoints was cardiac event and stroke and safety endpoint was major bleed. Standard antiplatelets were given to all. Almost 97% received aspirin where dose was less than 100 mg and dual antiplatelets there in almost 80%. Time to randomization was about mean six days. So immediately after SCS, within first week only, they were randomized. And STEMI was in 40 and NSTEMI was in 40%. What was the result? Primary endpoint of efficacy, that is cardiovascular death, MI or stroke, was no different with epixaban. And actually there was significant increase in TME major bleeding with epixaban. So this trial, a very good molecule, but for SCS, this molecule did not work. Five milligram twice a day of Epixaban over the dual antiplatelet or at least single antiplatelet, increased bleeding and there was no reduction in recurrent ischemia. There is, so Epixaban failed. So what about Rivaroxaban, which is another factor 10 inhibitor, which is exactly acts like at same place and it is slightly more widely studied. And in TME 46 trial in 2009, we have seen that when you give the dose of Rivaroxaban more than 10 milligrams, actually it increases bleeding. But Whatever trial was there, it clearly showed that death, MI or stroke is reduced with rivaroxaban. So this was studied and this trial was presented yesterday, I mean published yesterday only in NEJM, January 5th, 2012, so I am presenting today, Atlas ACS2 TME 51 trial, multi-center randomized trial, more than 15,000 patients with recent ACS. Rivaroxaban was given in two doses, 2.5 mg twice a day and 5 mg twice a day, and it was compared with placebo. Follow-up was for two years, primary endpoint efficacy was again same, cardiac event and stroke, safety was bleeding. Standard antiplatelet were given to all, aspirin dose was 100 maximum, dual antiplatelet was there in 93%, and time to randomization was mean 4.6 days. So again, after ACS, within first week, all these patients were given Rivaroxaban. STEMI was 50%, NSTEMI was 25%, and rest 25% were unstable angina. This molecule was significantly effective to achieve primary endpoint. It re significantly reduced death, cardiovascular, I mean death, MI or stroke, and both doses were useful. 2.5 million twice a day and 5 million twice a day. Of course, when you get something, bleeding was slightly more. I mean, in this slide, actually 2.5 million twice a day dose actually reduced the cardiac cause of death also, while 5 million per, 5 million twice a day did not reduce cardiovascular cause of death. So 2.5 million twice a day was even better to reduce cardiac cause of death. And as I told, bleeding was more. ICH was clearly related to dose of the rivaroxaban, but fatal bleeding and fatal ICH was same as placebo. So message from this trial was, in high risk patients with SES, who are already on antiplatelets. Both doses of rivaroxaban was useful. Reduced risk of death, MI and stroke was there. There was increased major bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage, but fatal bleeding and fatal ICH was not there. There is another interesting molecule in SES. This is a platelet. We have seen that there are various receptors in platelet. Thromboxin ATO receptor is blocked by uh, aspirin. P2Y12 receptor is blocked by clopidogrel, prazugrel, ticagrel, or cangrelor. There are GP2B3 blockers, and there is new receptor that is pro protease activator receptor, PAR1 and PAR4. And this re receptor is blocked by this new molecule, which is interesting molecule, which is a, and this receptor is activated by thrombin, actually. Very small quantity of thrombin can act par, uh, activate PAR1, while large amount of thrombin needs to activate PAR4. So this is a very sensitive receptor and Vorapaxar, it actually inhibits this PAR1 receptor and this was studied and even preclinical models of this molecule has shown favorable result without affecting hemostatic function. So whether this molecule is useful in SES or no, this trial was published yesterday in NEJM, tracer trial, multicenter randomized trial, more than 12,000 patients with SES, but no STEMI was there, mean age was 64. Vorapaxar, loading dose was 40 milligram and maintenance dose was 2.5 milligram daily. That was compared with placebo. Plan follow-up was for two years, but was stopped prematurely at 500 days. Primary efficacy endpoint was again same, cardiac event and stroke. 
and safety was major bleeding. Almost everybody received antiplatelet aspirin or thinoparidine. Primary efficacy endpoint was almost negative. It was not effective to reduce uh, stroke or cardiac events and there was increased bleeding with uh, this new molecule. So message from this trial was that in high-risk patients with SES who are already on antiplatelet, Vorapaxar did not significantly reduce primary composite endpoint and it significantly increased the risk of major bleeding including ICH. So what we have learnt in SES? Epixaban in Epres 2 and Vorapaxar in Tracer, they are not useful. Rioraxaban in both doses in ATLAS ACS2 TIMI51 trial reduced the endpoint, it was clinically useful and 2.5 million twice daily dose was even better because it had better benefit risk balance and when you give this it reduces uh, all cause mortality by 32% with 2.5 million twice daily dose and if patient is receiving dual entry rate then risk reduction was up to 36%. So this translates into one death prevention if you treat 56 patients for two years. What about statins? We have seen that uh, if you give statins, there is maize reduction is up to 36 percent or even with Jupiter it is up to 46 percent. At any level of statin you give and you get risk reduction. So it is useful. Even at less than 100 you start statin, patient is benefited. And we have seen by IWAS that median change in percentage ethroma volume, that means if you give statin in a and you, when you reduce the LDL level to less than 70, you may actually get regression, atherosclerosis regression, and that is our aim. So, what will you prefer? We have got two best molecules if you give in largest dose, whether you should give rosuvastatin 40 or atorva 80. Both are proven molecules, both are given in large doses to have atherosclerosis regression. So, this was studied in Saturn trial, again published in NEJM, multicenter randomized trial, more than 1,000 patients with CAD were symptomatic and angiographically their lesion was less than 50, more than 20. LDL was more than 80 on statin or more than 100 without statin. Mean age was 57. Atrova 80 was compared with Rosuva 40. Follow-up was for two years. Primary endpoint was percentage atherosclerotic volume. That means maximum severity of uh, atherosclerotic, uh, I mean, atherosclerotic stenotic lesion. And secondary endpoint was total atherosclerotic volume. That is uh, atherosclerotic burden. Means all plaques and total atherosclerotic volume. And follow, I mean, this was studied by intravascular ultrasound at, at beginning and at the end of two years. If you compare Atrova and Rosuva, primary endpoint, that was median change in percentage atroma volume, was not statistically different. Both equally reduced this uh, maximum severity of atherosclerosis. But if you compare individually, change from baseline to end of two years, Atrova also caused significant regression, Rosuva also caused significant regression, but if you compare these two, as far as total atheroma volume was con uh, is concerned, Rosuva was better than Atrova. This is a more interesting alarming or throat powering. Both actually reduce or cause uh, regression, but up to only in two-thirds of patients. So in spite of maximum possible doses of whatever available statin we have in, uh, in the world today, still only 66% patients have regression and one third patients still continue to progress. Atherosclerosis is still progress with maximum dose of statin uh, in our population. And what is the difference in side effect? Atorua had slightly more rise in uh, SCPT while uh, Rosua had slightly more rise in uh, protein secretion in urine. The protein area was slightly more with uh, Rosua statin. And the graph actually, we could, atherosclerosis regression graph, actually we, can, we could still pull it uh, leftward and downward. So this was the maximum regression we could achieve so far in all the trials. So message from certain trial was that for primary IVUS endpoint, Rosuva was equal to Atrova. So both cause uh, equal number, equal amount of uh, maximum severity uh, plaque regression. But secondary endpoint, that was total atheroma burden was slightly better uh, regress with Rosuva compared to Atorva. And this extent, of extent and frequency of regression was unprecedented so far in all the clinical trials. But major concern is nearly one third of patients continue to progress and we still need to do more. We need some more molecules which can prevent total uh, regress, I mean which can prevent progression of atherosclerosis. Another molecule, niacin. It reduces LDL cholesterol and we know that there is benefit. It increases HDL, but we don't know whether benefit is there in clinical uh, outcome or no. 
and it reduces triglyceride, but still later about triglyceride are conflicting. So this, we know that as HDL level is increased, your uh, coronary event rate is reduced. So even we had nine niacin trial which are uh, compared with placebo, way back in 1975, three gram was given and we had significant reduction in death, stroke and MI. And even in head trial, niacin was com uh, combined with simvastatin and there was atherosclerotic regression angiographically. So in AIM high trial, which was very much, uh, I mean, eagerly awaited, results were eagerly awaited, and this was a multicenter randomized trial where niacin was compared with, uh, niacin with statin was compared with uh, statin alone. More than 3,000 patients who had either coronary artery disease, co uh, cardiovascular disease, or peripheral vascular disease, and having dyslipidemia, <coughs> HDL less than 40, and triglyceride around one, more, 150 to 400, and LDL less than 180. Niacin in dose of 15 to 200, uh, uh, two gram was compared with uh, placebo. Both group received simvastatin 40 to 80 milligram plus minus azitimab to keep the LDL level less than 40 to 80. So very aggressive statin therapy was already there and on top of that niacin was added. Mean follow-up was supposed to be 4.6 years or even up to 7 years but it was stopped at 3 years. Target LDL level as I told was 40 to 80 milligram and primary endpoint was again same coronary events and stroke. Interesting thing is that when the patients were entered in the, in the trial, already 94% patients were receiving statin and almost 20% were already on niacin when they entered into the, into the trial. As expected, significant reduction was there with, uh, in the significant rise in HDL was there with combination therapy compared to only monotherapy with statin. Significant reduction was there with triglyceride and significant reduction was there with LDL also. So naturally combination therapy means when you add niacin to statin, you get better lipids. But primary endpoint, clinical outcome was same. Whether you add niacin or no, there was no difference. And actually trial was stopped because there was some trend for increased incidence of ischemic stroke with niacin. So that's why trial was stopped. But of course this difference was not significant. So message from this trial was among patients with stable cardiovascular disease whose LDL was less than 70, addition of niacin does not help. Only statin is enough. This was despite better HDL and better triglyceride with niacin. So what went wrong in this trial? See, as, as I told that at entry point, 94% uh, patients were receiving statin, 20% were receiving niacin. So there was plaques were already stabilized. There was nothing much to do further. Trial was stopped prematurely at three years instead of seven years. Even placebo arm received about 100 to 200 milligrams of niacin per day to mimic the side effect of flushing. So even placebo group were given small minimum minuscule dose of uh, niacin. And even 25% patients on niacin group actually stopped the drug prematurely because of side effect. And premature stoppage of trial was due to trend for increased ischemic stroke with niacin, but that p-value was not significant. Still, uh, safety committees thought that we should stop it. And of the patients, of the, all the patients who got stroke, 8% uh, of stroke in niacin group were there actually two months later after stopping the niacin. So it, they were actually considered in the niacin group only with the intention to treat by this. And actually no other study has shown any increased stroke with niacin. It, and in fact, a coronary drug project, which was published in 1975, showed actually 25% reduction in stroke with niacin. So this, this finding of uh, stroke was actually, some believe that uh, if we would have given, followed the patient for seven years, possibly this uh, side effect was, might, might not have appeared. And there was actually unexpected 9.8% increase in HDL in even placebo arm. So basically the primary, I mean, this, this uh, trial where, was, which was supposed to achieve 12.5% lower event rate, I mean this trial actually achieved 12.5% lower event rate where predicted event rate reduction was 25% on which uh, power was calculated. So instead of 25% reduction in event, actually in this trial because of uh, much better LDL lowering in placebo arm and good rise of HDL in placebo arm, event lowering was only 12.5%, so power was not sufficient at the end of the three years, and that's why actually niacin did not work. So what should we do? 
In a patient who has a stable coronary disease or cardiovascular disease or peripheral disease who has low HDL, which is very, very common scenario in India, should we stop using niacin, yes or no? See, if we achieve LDL less than 70 or non-HDL less than 100, you give your patient maximum dose of statin plus minus azitimab to achieve LDL of less than 70 or non-HDL of less than 100. If you give, achieve this, then niacin probably has no role. But if these goals are not achieved with a maximum tolerated statin dose or azitimab dose, and or if patient is high risk, like patient is SES, post-MI, ITG, or high lipoprotein little a, then addition of niacin or fibroid may be beneficial. And of course, HPS2 Thrive study, which consists of 25,000 patients, will be published next year, will guide further about the role of niacin in this setting. Another trial, CEPT inhibitors. They increase HDL, reduces LDL, but TOR setup unfortunately failed. So do you think that newer molecules will help? TORSATRIB actually failed because it had uh, off-target action. It upregulated the renin angiotensin system and it caused increased BP, increased circulating aldosterone level, and there was uh, altered serum electrolytes. So that's why there was side effect and there was increased uh, uh, hypertension and negative outcome. But this was not a SEPT inhibitor's class effect. It was only TOR setup as a molecule which activated RAS, which was an off-target action. So there is new molecule known as dal cetrapib, whether it will be effective and safe. So this was uh, studied in dal plec trial, which is a very interesting trial. It is the first multi-center study using novel non-invasive imaging to assess plaque burden and plaque inflammation, totally non-invasively. So what was done in this trial? It was a multi-center randomized phase 2B trial, around 130 patients with coronary disease or respectors for CAD were studied, mean age was 64. And dial set up 600 million per day was given, was compared with placebo and followed for two years. How was imaging done? MRI was done for carotid to study the plaque morphology, and PET scan was done to see pet plaque inflammation. MRI was done at six months, 12 months, and at two years, while PET was done at six, three months and six months. Statin use was there in more than 80% of patients, and baseline average LDL was less than 100, TG was less than 400. This is how image looks on MRI. These are both carotids, and you can measure the total vessel area. You can measure the wall area, lumen area, wall thickness. Everything can be measured totally non visually by MRI. And for plaque inflammation, PET CT can be done. In the first thing, this is plain CT, and this is PET CT, and this uh, PET signal are correlated with inflammation by histology. So you get more signals like this. That means inflammation is more. So this is also totally studied non-invasively in this study. And what was the effect? When you give this molecule, you got better outcome. There is less progression of uh, vessel area, and HDL was increased by almost 30 percent. So this is one example how it looks on uh, uh, when vessel area is actually reduced with at the end of two years uh, non-invasively demonstrated by MRI. And if you see individual thing. Total vessel area measured by MRI, on left side is placebo, on right side is a molecule, dull set of rib, and there was significant difference in the year it actually progressed. Vessel become more and more. That means the burden increased, while here it remains static. And plaque inflammation also, actually here it was reduced, while here it remains same, and p-value was significant here for reduction in uh, inflammation. So message from this trial was that this was, there was no harm, Actually, vessel area, total vessel area was reduced, and actually inflammation was also reduced. And lipids were increased by 30%. HDL was increased by 30%, and there was 10% increase in APOA1 also. And it was a very safe molecule. There was no rise in BP, no activation of renin angiotensin system. But this was a morphological study, an inflammation study. We still need to have long-term outcome in clinical outcome efficacy. So in future, clinical outcome efficacy trial will tell us whether this molecule is useful or no. See, statins, promoters always say that statins are great. Opponents say that we don't have, we don't have any very long-term efficacy or safety data. They say that it is not safe on long run. So this HPS study is very interesting. 10, 11-year follow-up. 
You remember this HPA study was uh, published uh, eight, ten years back with 20,000 patients of coronary disease, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Age was 40 to 80. Where simvastatin 40 milligram was compared with placebo, and follow-up was for five, for five years. So what at the end of five years trial was stopped, but then investigator continued to follow these patients for 11 years. So it is an interesting follow-up, and primary endpoint was any major vascular event. See, FOS enrollment was over in 1997, and this trial, HPS trial, was published in October 2001. And post-trial follow-up was uh, completed in March 2007. If you see it, that at the end of uh, five years, 85% on the simvastatin arm were receiving uh, statin, while in placebo, 17% were receiving statin. Once trial was stopped, I mean, physicians were encouraged to continue whatever they wish. So statin people stopped taking statin from 85, they become 58 percent, while by this time, by end of 2001, statin's overall benefits were already known in the, in the, in the world, and people who were on placebo arm, they started taking statin. So equal number of patients were there at the end of five, uh, one year, but at the end of five years, although it was not mandatory, but people continued to take statin. Almost equal number of patients were on statin in follow-up. As expected, when patients at the end of five years, when they were on statin, cholesterol was reduced to 164, while in placebo it was high. Same way LDL was reduced to 90 with statin at the end of five years, first five years in first HPS, and it was not, it was very high in the placebo arm. But at the end of 11 years, when both group had equal number of statin taking patients, then cholesterol was almost equal and LDL, LDL was also equal at the end of 11 years. And as expected, at the end of first follow-up of HPS, that was at the end of the trial, at 5.3 years, naturally simvastatin was better in reducing uh, coronary events. What do you think? What will happen at the, 11, at the end of 11 years? Now we have got two, two groups. One is placebo group, so-called placebo group, who is on statin. 85% of this, this group also, red line people are also taking statin now. And they are now taking, and they are followed for next six years. This group also 85% are receiving statin now, and they're also followed till 11 years. What will happen? What will happen to this graph? Can you tell? Whether it will merge, will remain same, or diverse, or reverse. It can reverse also, because statin, open and solvers believe that if you take statin for 10 years, you will die of intracerebral hemorrhage or cancer or something like that. So, overall survival may not be good also. So, what do you think? It remains same. I mean, diverse is good actually, but equal number of people are taking statin, 85, and LDL and cholesterol level were also same, so we don't expect it to diverge at least, but it remains same. So this was very interesting. And cancer was same, if you think of a different site of cancer, that was also same at the end of 11 years of statin. So message from this trial was that among patients with uh, stable CAD, diabetes, hypertension, and peripheral vascular disease, earlier the statin is given, larger is the absolute reduction in the vascular event. Many persisted at the end of five years of completion of study without any evidence of emerging hazard and absolutely no increase in incidence of cancer of any kind. So these, provi these findings provide further so support for the prompt initiation and long-term continuation of statin treatment. There is another trial, which is also actually follow-up of some of the trials. Jupiter trial showed that less LDL less than uh, 130 and CRP more than 2 benefited, I mean, Rosewater statin benefits them. But if you take or count uh, coronary artery calcium by CT, CT scan, whether you can further stratify the risk or no, that was studied in this thing. And we know that if calcium score is uh, less than uh, 1%, then, I mean, is zero or minimum, then mortality rate at the end of 10 years is just 1%. But if there is significant calcium score, then there is 10 times increased risk. So this was studied in, a, in a, this population multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis participants were there where about 950 patients had uh, HSCRP more than two and they were studied here. So this was a Jupiter-like population where HPS was more than two and they were given and their calcium score was uh, calculated by uh, CT scan. Score was zero, one to 100 or more than 100 and they were followed for six years. And first vascular event was noted. So if your calcium score was zero, coronary disease rate or cardiovascular disease rate was minimal. Compared to that, if calcium score was more than 100, event was significantly more. 
And this is interesting finding. If your high sensitive CRP is more than 2, if your calcium score is less than 100, your event rate is less. But if your calcium score is 100 or more, event rate is very high. But even if your HSCRP is less than 2, then also calcium score, if it is low, event re remains low. But if your calcium score is high, your event rate is equally bad. And same thing happened with uh, cardiovascular disease. So this marker, calcium score, is even more, more sensitive marker than HSCRP according to this trial. So message from this trial, the trial was that calcium artery, uh, coronary artery calcium seems, for the, uh, seems to further stratify the risk. High CSE, even with low HSCRP, predicts the poor prognosis. And low CSE, even with high, high CRP, predicts good prognosis. So focusing of treatment on this subject could allow better appropriate allocation of resources. What about diabetes? There are just two small trials about diabetes. So microalbuminia is an early predictor of diabetic nephropathy and premature cardiovascular disease. Guidelines says that if you have got diabetes and CKD, your target BP should be less than 130-80. We know that S inhibitor and ARB both are actually useful to prevent uh, albumin secretion, albumin excretion through urine. We have got Benedict trial with trandalopril, OP trial with remipril, transit trial with telmisartan, renal trial with losartan, and IDNT trial with ibesartan. All this showed that uh, they are beneficial in reducing microalbuminuria, which will ultimately reduce your CKD and uh, cardiovascular disease also. Whether olmisartan is useful or no, that was never studied in this way. So in roadmap trial, only certain was studied. More than 4,000 patients who were type 2 diabetic and had one risk factor for cardiovascular disease and mean age was 58. Only 40 was compared with placebo, followed for three years. Primary endpoint was time to first onset of microalbuminuria and secondary endpoint was time to onset of renal or cardiovascular event. Additional antihypertensive drugs were given except for SI inhibitor or ARB to keep BP less than 130-80 in, in both the groups. And actually, on, on treatment group, that is only certain group, had slightly better BP control and BP was about 3 by 2 millimeter less with only certain group compared to placebo group. What was the result? Time to onset of microalbuminuria was in favor of only certain. So only certain was useful. It, caused, uh, it, it reduced microalbuminuria and time to onset of microalbuminuria micro was delayed uh, with only certain. So primary endpoint was achieved. But what this was very shocking or surprising. Cardiovascular mortality was significantly increased with only certain. So what happened? In type 2 diabetes, with risk factor for cardiovascular disease, only certain lowers the microalbuminuria, but there is higher fatal cardiovascular event with only certain. And why this happened? They believe that it may be a chance or it was seen only in patients who had pre-existing coronary artery disease. And it was more so if this patient who had already coronary artery disease and had even BP which was uh, lower than even uh, 130, 80 or it had to around say 120, 70 or even less. So there was a Jacob effect in a patient who had Olmisartan. Olmisartan is a very strong anti-hypertensive and as I, as I mentioned that BP was further lower compared to placebo group with Olmisartan. And actually, even original study with only certain also had showed increased cardiovascular mortality. So now question comes, as far as other ARBs are concerned, losartan, valsartan, irbesartan, or candesartan, none of this molecule has shown any increased cardiovascular mortality in any of the trial. While there are at least two trials, this trial, Roadmap and Orient, both had shown increased cardiovascular mortality with only certain in patients who had already coronary artery disease and where VP reduction was too aggressive. So European Society of Hypertension, after this trial, has clearly showed that avoid lowering BP excessively. Don't go below 120-70 if your patient is diabetic and hypertensive and is because it can increase uh, cardiovascular disease uh, event. FDA is still reviewing data as usual. They are always slipping and they, they don't change their guideline routinely or rapidly. And there is no black box warning declared yet uh, uh, by FDA yet. This is the last trial for today. IGT increases cardiovascular disease and conversion to diabetes. And different glitazones have controversial roles. So what is there with pioglitazone? Act now trial, multicenter randomized trial with 600 patients of IGT. They were given 30 
5 liters on day one, I mean for one month and then it was increased to 45 milligram per day and it was continued and follow up was for 2.4 years. Primary endpoint was development of diabetes. APS was checked every four months and GTT was done yearly. IGT was defined as a two hour glucose level of 140 to 199 milligram per deciliter. As expected, pyoglitazone was uh, significantly better for preventing uh, development of diabetes. Primary endpoint was achieved. As expected, fasting glucose was significantly less with pyoglitazone. Two hour uh, uh, postprandial glucose was also significantly less with pyoglitazone. But as expected, again, there was significantly increased weight gain with uh, pyoglitazone. And actually, interestingly, carotid intima media thickness was just significant uh, enough to be in favor of pyoglitazone. So C CMT ratio was reduced with pyoglitazone. There was some anti atherosclerotic action with pyoglitazone. So message from this trial was that pyoglitazone reduced the risk of conversion of IGT to type 2 diabetes. It caused significant weight gain in edema. And long-term clinical event trial will be of interest. So this was a just basic trial, but whether clinically this is translated into reduction in the clinical event or no, that is to be seen. Thank you. So I'd like to talk uh, briefly on uh, some relation between pathophysiology and the therapeutic targets we have. So we'd like to uh, talk briefly first on substrates and triggers, a little bit on reperfusion injury, briefly on contractile recovery, and then a few new information about limiting infarct size. So we all are born with supposedly normal coronary arteries, also probably with a number of risk factors, which will then develop asymptomatic atherosclerosis. A few among us will develop vulnerable plaque of high-risk plaques, and then at one point in time, triggers, triggers will be the, uh, responsible for thrombosed plaques, which then will lead either to acute coronary syndromes with unstable angina, STEMI, or sudden cardiac deaths, or progression of an already present stenosis with stable angina, or progression with asymptomatic lesions. Triggers. Well, there are potentially adverse acute physiological changes like blood pressure and heart rate surges, autonomic changes, acute vasoconstriction, prothrombotic, inflammatory, and also imbalances between electrolytes. This may give in turn transient ischemia or plaque disruption and the known consequences, myocardial infarction, VTVF, or sudden cardiac deaths. Just an example of such a trigger, if you look at the daily numbers of cardiovascular death in the Los Angeles County in January 93, you find an even number throughout the period in January. If you compare the same period one year later, you find one outliner here, and this is synchronous with the Northridge earthquake, and there are multiple examples of such uh, triggers responsible for a certain increase in cardiac death. I would like to um, briefly point to a substrate which has been in focus quite recently, and this is the Vasa Vasorum at the level of the plaque. Due to plaque angiogenesis, which then might be responsible to intraplaque hemorrhage and plaque rupture. And already in 1955, Duff stated that it seems to be one of the special misfortunes of the human race that the development of atherosclerosis should be accompanied by the formation of a new capillary network in the thickened intima. And indeed, it has been shown repeatedly that plaques, as you can see here, when you inject the Vasa Vasorum, you find an intricate network at the level of the plaque. 
It's been shown, indeed, that in, in pathology, that the number of vasa vasorum are more frequent in ruptured plaque compared to stable plaques. Now we know that uh, the normal vessels only carry a few vasa vasorum, while in the atherosclerosis uh, vessels, vasa vasorum increases significantly. And this is due to the imbalance between what we call the pro-angiogenic growth factor expression and the endogenous inhibitors of angiogenesis, which normally are in balance. We know what the stimuli are for the pro-angiogenic growth factors to be expressed. They are hypoxia, inflammation, hypertension, oxidative stress, nicotine. We know the sources where those uh, factors are coming from, from the vascular smooth muscle, from the platelets, the leukocytes, black microvascular endothelium, and we also know the factors themselves, VGF, PDGF, FGF, and HGF. They are upregulated in atherosclerosis, while on the other hand, the endogenous inhibitors are downregulated. And this result in a cartoon here, while these vasa vasorum are in direct contact with capillaries which are feeding the plaque. And it's interesting that those capillaries doesn't have fingers to protect the increased pressure. So it seems that the, um, that the pressure inside the plaque and inside those capillary just reflects the intra coronary pressure through connections directly with the vasa vasorum. And those, those capillaries are different from the standard capillaries. They are leaking, they are responsible for um, uh, oozing of red blood cells in the plaque, responsible for hemorrhage. I don't have time to go into detail. And then finally, due to the pressure difference, P1, which is the similar or almost similar as the pre-stenotic pressure, and the P2 distal to the pressure, which is slower, it's this pressure difference we then may lead to a plaque rupture. Turning to reperfusion injury, we know that when you occlude the coronary artery, you have a few um, minutes where everything is reversible if you restore perfusion. But then, after 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you start to have an increased um, ischemic injury, which becomes irreversible. If at one point in time, you reperfuse the myocardium, of course, at that time, you will halt the ischemic injury. But in addition, you will create some reperfusion injury, but still, you will be left by some degree of a salvaged myocardium. Now, what are the uh, major players in reperfusion injury? Well, you have the immediate response, the reactive oxygen species, and calcium overload are hand in hand responsible for uh, reperfusion injury. And then you have the delayed response, which is more of an inflammatory response produced by the neutrophils. So what does reactive oxygen species do to myocytes? Well, they, they, due to the lipid peroxidation, they alter the membrane characteristics, thereby increasing permeability, increasing intracellular calcium, resulting in cell swelling and cell death. At the same time, the reactive oxygen species are toxins on the endothelial cells by releasing pro-inflammatory mediators from those cells, thereby uh, increasing the expression of adhesion molecules, which in turn are responsible for increased permeability, increased adherence of neutrophiles, which in turn will also uh, produce more ROS, attenuation of factors with anti-neutrophil properties, overexpression of endothelium-derived pro-inflammatory factors, 
they will produce peroxynitrite and also responsible for further leukotactic signals. Now calcium overload is, um, occurs because during ischemia your intracellular PA drops drastically, the cell becomes acidotic and the cell tries to uh, counteract by uh, excluding, excluding uh, protons for exchange in, in sodium. But because the sodium pump is an active pump, it stops due to the ischemia, so uh, sodium is then exchanged for calcium and resulting in calcium overload. Now the same mechanism halt during the reperfusion phase. There is an acute extrusion of uh, a rapid proton efflux by also the lactate by the co-transported. At the same time, the sodium proton exchanges resulting in influx of sodium. Sodium, which increases, will be trying to neutralize first to leaving the reactivated pump, but also by exchanging it for uh, calcium. And again, you have a calcium overload during the reperfusion phase causing reperfusion injury. Now what's becoming uh, lately in, in the focus is that the mitochondrion seems to be the common denominator for the final cell death. And the mitochondria has what they call mitochondrial permeability, mitochondrial permeability transition pores we can open and close. And conditions for opening these pores are calcium overload, oxi oxidative stress, a restoration of a neutral pH, low ATP levels and high phosphate levels. So all conditions present during ischemia. Now what happens on opening of these pores, <coughs> the major thing is the uncoupling of the oxidative phosphorylation, collapse of the membrane potential, mitochondrial swelling, and finally ni uh, necrotic cell death. One slide about the functional recovery, not because it's not important, but this is all well now that experimentally, if you occlude the coronary artery for one hour, you lose your regional function completely, and over the following uh, days and weeks, you find a, let's say, 75% recovery of your renal function. If you prolong the occlusion for two hours, recovery will be much less. If you occlude your coronary artery for three hours, there is only mild recovery of minimal recovery. And of course, if the occlusion is permanent, the, uh, re the uh, regional function does not recover at all. So this just to uh, uh, remind you of the fact of time, which is important in trying to save myocardium. Of course, a number of factors will play a role in the scheme, the extent of ischemia, the presence of collaterals, and so on, may affect these recovery curves. So we'll try to uh, give a few issues about therapeutic targets. Of course, reducing ischemic time is of the utmost importance. We all know this from our clinical practice. We can, of course, restore the oxygen balance by pharmacotherapy. I don't uh, go to an uh, extent on this issue. We will increase oxygen supply by revascularization, preferably by primary PCI, thrombolysis, and in a few cases, uh, in cabbage. But what is more important is that we now have potential to protect the uh, myocardium um, to sustain ischemia for a prolonged period of time. And here I would just mention the uh, post-conditioning and some pharmaco pharmacological elements which are mimicking post-conditioning. So 
the issue of time, I showed you already that if you reperfuse a coronary artery, you will halt your ischemic injury, but you pay the price of some reperfusion injury, but still you will salvage your myocardium. Reducing the ischemic time will reduce your ischemic injury, will reduce probably your reperfusion injury and increase the myocardium you will be able to salvage. Now, what is ischemic post-conditioning? Just follow me through this experiment. You occlude experimentally a coronary artery for 60 minutes. You reperfuse this artery, you have an uh, area at risk. And then finally, if you look at the infarct size four hours post-reperfusion, you find a sizable infarct size. Now you repeat the same experiments, but instead of acutely reperfusing, you are going to do it in a staccato manner, whereby you will alternate your reperfusion with again a one minute of occlusion, one minute of reperfusion, one minute of occlusion, one minute of reperfusion, so five times in a row, and you will end up four hours later when you look at the infarct size at the very reduced infarct size. This seems <coughs> intuitively something that in the past experimentally this has been uh, shown. Now the intracellular signaling is rather complex. I just want to point out that the, that the endogenous adenosine and bradykinin which is released during the ischemia through the G uh, coupled, the G protein coupled receptors will uh, trigger a number of uh, intracellular pathways. One of them is the ERK and the ACK pathways. We will result in an anti-epiptotic effect which will uh, be protective on the transition pores. At the same time, the increased adenosine and uh, bradykinin through the um, uh, proton sodium exchanger, which will be blocked, will keep the pH, the intracellular pH low. And by keeping the intracellular pH low, will have a protective effect on the uh, pores, on the mitochondrium, and thereby being a protective effect for the uh, uh, myocardium. Is this something which is um, happening in, in, in real time? And indeed, a couple of years ago, uh, a reperfusion during primary PCI was compared to the classic reperfusion in which you inflate the balloon and you stent the artery and you reperfuse acutely your infarct compared to a reperfusion strategy which you alternate balloon inflations and balloon deflations each minute uh, for each. And then by calculating the CK release and the area under the curve, you see that there is a systemic decrease in the uh, post-conditioning protocol. And this translates significantly in in infarct size reduction, which was analyzed with SPECT six months after the protocol, with a reduce in the perfusion defect. So the post-conditioning, although it looks like a complex intracellular signaling pathway, it's an easy a way of protecting and of reducing the infarct size uh, during acute PCI for acute myocardial infarction. So to summarize, um, our therapeutic approaches, revascularization is of course of the essence. Time is crucial. We know that the more we can decrease time, the more myocardium we will be able to save. 
but now we have evidence that we can protect the ischemic myocardium from evolution towards necrosis by some easy measures as using the post um, ischemic uh, conditioning mechanism. And recent studies have shown that uh, some uh, pharmacological tools like morphine or cyclosporine are also triggering the same signaling, intra-signaling pathway and thereby, and thereby producing the same effect. And of course, morphine can be given well in advance of the PCI and thereby already triggering this cascade of intracellular signaling. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'm going to discuss antiplatelet treatment in ACS, emerging evidence. Uh, I have, of course, disclosures. We have been collaborating with several of the pharmaceutical companies in clinical trials over uh, the last years. So let me tell you where I come from. Uh, I am coming from Sweden, and um, I don't know whether you know where Sweden might be. It's a small country. The population of the whole of Sweden is about the same as uh, Bombay, nine million people, and we are situated up here in the north uh, at the same a altitude as Greenland. It's somewhat warmer in Sweden though because we have the Gulf Stream. India is down there, so it's around uh, nine, nine, ten hours flight. And, and I am working at the uh, University Hospital in Uppsala, and it is part of uh, the Uppsala University, find, founded in 1477. So it's quite an old uh, university and a very old medical school. Sweden is well organized, so it's a socialized healthcare system. And these are all the different hospitals, around 70 hospitals in Sweden are caring for patients with acute medical conditions and cardiac conditions. And in, in Sweden we kind of have the iCloud for <coughs> monitoring care in heart disease. We have an internet-based registry covering really all admissions to, for cardiac care in all these different hospitals. It's internet-based and it can be addressed by all personnel, physicians and nurses, and <clears throat> so we enter patient data over the web or from electronic patient records into patients going to CCU who have coronary procedures, bypass surgery, and then are followed for secondary prevention, and these are combined into a common registry, and <clears throat> these can be addressed over the internet by an iPad or <clears throat> a computer and every year we merge the databases from the hospital data with the follow-up, which is complete. We have a hospital admission registry, which is governmental. We have a course of death registry, and we even have a medication prescription registry. So in Sweden, in this small population, we can really track every patient from his first admission until death concerning readmissions and every type of care. And by that we can really monitor what has happened in acute coronary syndrome. This is the development of reperfusion treatment in STEMI over the last 17 years, more or less. So therefore you can see that we started with a thrombolysis in the 1990s, and then we had <coughs> ambulance treatment with bolus injections of thrombolytics, but over the last four or five years everything has gone into primary PCI. <laughs> and by that we have also increased reperfusion treatment in the whole population. And this covers now every hospital, so, th so the development is based on what happens in all types of hospitals. We can also monitor over the last, as you can see, 13, 14 years, the development of treatment with antithrombotic agents. And this is aspirin, of course, that was used early together with a vitamin K antagonist and then clopidogrel was introduced and you can see the gradual take up in almost all patients with STEMI and somewhat slower in patients with non-STEMI 
And this gradual development depends on that the different hospitals accept the treatment at a different rate. So there are rapid adopters and there are more <coughs> slow development in other centers. And we think that has influenced the dramatic development that has been seen in all countries concerning mortality, for example, here in non-ST elevation AMI. You can see year by year a drop in mortality there are around 10,000 patients that we can monitor here each year. And you can see that there is more than a halving, even a 60% reduction in hospital mortality. And this is reflected in 30-day mortality and even over one year. And we can track mortality for up to 10 years. And this initial benefit is maintained over 10 years. And even if you adjust for background factors that might be different over the years. You have this dramatic development, which of course <coughs> probably is influenced mainly by early revascularization and antithrombotic treatments. So we have over the last years <coughs> had this development. Of course, aspirin <coughs> was introduced in the late 1980s, 1990s, and then we had clopidogrel, but all these <coughs> Plated receptors have only been known for the last 10, 12 years. And it was a knowledge of the P2 white cell receptor uh, that led us to understand the mechanism of action of cyclopidin, and then clopidogrel was developed. But because of the weaknesses of clopidogrel, we now have new P2 white cell inhibitors, another tyanopyridine, an indirect inhibitor, prasugrel, the direct inhibitors mainly ticagrelor, and we also have <coughs> tested other mechanisms, as you recently heard, concerning the, the PAR1 inhibitor with Warapaxer and other agents. I think tenopyridines have really been a savior for many patients that have had <coughs> stent implantation. It has reduced stent thrombosis, and clopidogrel aspirin has been the current standards in ACS treatment for the last five to 10 years. But clopidogrel is a prodrug with a slow onset of action and with a variable plated inhibition. We haven't really realized that. We have thought that clopidogrel really inhibits platelet activity in all patients. Prasugrel is another prodrug, but it has a much more rapid onset than clopidogrel and really no variability in response and more pronounced plated inhibition is achieved. So I think all of you know the CURE trial and the standard trials, and what we have seen a few, in 2009 was the results when we increased the loading dose of clopidogrel from 300 to 600 milligram, and even tried to use a double dose of standard clopidogrel 150 rather than 75 milligram daily in compared to the standard dosages. And in this <coughs> current trial also a higher aspirin dose was tested versus a lower dose for the first month. And I think all of you know the results. And <coughs> the results were really neutral, although 20,000 patients were exposed. But looking into a subgroup, patients who <coughs> were exposed to early PCI with a planned early PCI that was really performed. In that cohort, there was a reduction in <coughs> myocardial infarction, death, and stroke. And this was mainly driven by a reduction in stent thrombosis. So therefore, to use a higher loading dose of clopidogrel is beneficial in relation to patients undergoing PCI. And I think the conclusion most people have been drawing is that there is really a benefit in patients who undergo PCI, but in patients not undergoing PCI, the double dose of clopidogrel might rather be harmful, and there was no benefit with the higher dose versus a lower dose of aspirin. I think all of you also know the results with prasugrel, the other tainopyridine, the 60 milligram loading dose that will really maximally inhibit platelets in all patients, and the 10 milligram maintenance dose, 
that will not completely inhibit platelet activity in all patients, but in the vast majority. It is not useful to go up to higher dosages. 15 milligrams have been tested in phase two trials, but that will lead to even more bleedings. Five milligram is currently tested as a dose for elderly patients and in patients at low body weight, but it's still not, uh, the data are still not publicly available. So therefore, this is a standard dose of Prasugrel. It was tested in the Triton TIMI38 trial, which was a trial in patients undergoing PCI in those with a known coronary lesion. And then it was positive with this 2% absolute reduction <coughs> in death, MI, and stroke, and a dramatic reduction in stent thrombosis, but at the cost of increase in bleeding the increase in bleeding was there concerning major bleeds, life-threatening, non-fatal bleeds, and even uh, an increase in fatal bleeds was seen. It was around 30, 35% increase in bleeding. This was mainly seen in patients at higher age, low body weight, and previous stroke, and those are now excluded from the indication for Prasugrel in patients with ACS. So therefore, uh, it's definitely a step forward with Prasugrel because it reduces CV death, MI, and stroke, and it's especially driven by a reduction in procedure-related MI and a reduction in stent thrombosis. There is an increased risk of bleeding, but it seems to be possible to tailor the treatment to patients that tolerate this <coughs> more intense platelet inhibition. I have been very much involved with the development of Tacagalor, and this is a directly acting platelet inhibitor, ADP receptor inhibitor. It has a rapid onset, very consistent effect. It is a reversible binding, so it has a more rapid elimination of the antiplatelet effect than both clopidogrel and prasugrel. <coughs> There has been a lot of discussion whether this drug really inhibits platelets as much as Prasugrel is, but if you look into two different phase 1b trials, you can see that the degree of platelet inhibition with Prasugrel and Ticagrelor as compared to Clopidogrel is very similar. Both of them produce almost maximal inhibition very early on. You see an effect already after 30 minutes, and it stays <clears throat> continuously inhibited for the whole treatment period. And even after 24 hours after one dose of Ticagrelor, that needs to be given twice daily, you have the same inhibition as after <clears throat> 24 hours after the last dose of clopidogrel. <clears throat> so we tested this in the PLATO trial, and of course we had a lot of contribution from <clears throat> Indian centers, not least from Ahmedabad. And we used this in more or less all cameras with acute coronary syndromes, not only those <coughs> going to PCI, but also non-invasively managed patients. They were randomized early on, and people were allowed, even if they were on clopidogrel before <coughs> randomization. We allowed also a higher <coughs> dose of clopidogrel. We, we tried to give clopidogrel its best chance, so people were encouraged to use the higher loading dose. The results have been <coughs> presented over the last few years, and I will, at several sessions of this meeting, discuss the results in some detail. But overall, there was around a 2% absolute reduction. It was a continuous benefit over time. It was not driven um, that much by periprocedural MIs. And there was a reduction both in myocardial infarction and cardiovascular death, which has not really been seen in the other trials, neither with clopidogrel nor with prasugrel. And there was a reduction in cysts in patients that were invasively managed, <coughs> around 35% reduction in stent thrombosis. And of course, <coughs> we have looked into many of the subgroups. This is just to show that there was a reduction a similar reduction in the STEMI population, really regardless how STEMI was defined. And there was a reduction in the STEMI population, regardless whether a higher or a normal loading dose of clopidogrel was used. And delay time was not affecting 
the outcome at all. And there have been lots of discussion concerning which are the effects of ticagrelor if you compare to patients with a higher loading dose, so more than 600, 600 or more loading dose. And we were able to look into that subgroup. <coughs> there were around 3,600 patients compared to almost <coughs> 9,000 in the invasive population. And as you can see, there was really no heterogeneity, similar effects regardless of clopidogrel dose. So concerning clopidogrel, <coughs> the results were fairly straightforward. There was the one surprising finding in the PLATO trial and there was a heterogeneity in response in relation to different <coughs> areas, geographical areas. And there was one area in North America where ticagrelor was not that beneficial in relation to clopidogrel. And this was mainly seen in the US. In all other countries like in Europe, in Asia, in India, the results were <coughs> very consistent with the overall result. And after more than a year of work, it has turned out that the most likely reason for this outcome is an interaction with the aspirin dose. It was really only in the US that half of the patients were using a higher dose of aspirin, 325 milligram, for long term. There was a few patients outside the US scattered in different countries also using the higher dose. And in all patients on a higher loading dose, a higher maintenance dose of aspirin, both outside the US and in the US, there was a worse outcome with, a, <coughs> with ticagrelor. The lower the aspirin dose was, the better the outcome was. And the best outcome was really seen in a small subgroup without any aspirin. So this has led us to certain new thinking <coughs> in relation to antithrombotic treatment and platelet inhibition. Do we really need to add on one drug after the other to provide more and more anticoagulation and platelet inhibition and more and more bleeding? Shouldn't we test something else? Maybe if we inhibit platelets maximally by an agent like ticagrelor, adding aspirin might not me mean anything. It might even be better to remove aspirin because then you remove the side effects of bleeding and the side effects of reducing prostacycline. The side effects on the vessel wall with aspirin are removed. So, so maybe in the future we should look for new alternatives and this has been a possibility to do that. There has been a discussion whether we should tailor the treatment based on genetic testing and there is a genetic polymorphism, CYP2C19 polymorphism, <coughs> where you have less metabolism of clopidogrel that will affect uh, the outcome with clopidogrel. This does not at all affect the outcome with ticagrelor, but ticagrelor is better than clopidogrel regardless of this genetic polymorphism. So genetic testing doesn't seem to be that meaningful in relation to tailored treatment. Bleeding rates were similar overall with <coughs> ticagrelor and clopidogrel, but this was driven by procedural bleeds, cabbage bleeds. Outside cabbage there was really around a 30% increase in ble major bleeds with <coughs> ticagrelor as compared to clopidogrel. So there has been a very positive uptake of ticagrelor because it reduces really cardiovascular death and myon stroke and also cabbage-related death and procedure-related MI and stent thrombosis, and with similar benefits in many different subgroups. So therefore, it has now been accepted and approved in most countries and is also recommended as a drug of first choice in Europe for treatment of patients with acute coronary syndrome. And as you just heard concerning recent trials, we have seen the results with Vorapaxar, the first <coughs> thrombin receptor inhibitor, PAR1 receptor inhibitor, that was added on to patients treated with aspirin and clopidogrel. And this did not really lead to any reduction in the composite of death myocardial infarction, stroke, and oidentrivascularization. But 
if we had selected another endpoint, if we had selected the triple composite cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke, which we really recommended as lead investigators, then we would have seen a significant reduction around the same magnitude of reduction as seen in the other trials, in the PLATO trial and also in the, the recent trials with anticoagulants. So the interpretation might have been different if this endpoint would have been chosen. The bleeding risk is there, unfortunately, so therefore it's doubtful that this treatment ever will be accepted because of this increase in bleeding, which is the same as was seen with the new anticoagulants. It is not that different from results seen with rivaroxaban. There is one hope, though, that in patients not on clopidogrel, the results were not <coughs> that concerning in relation to bleeding. There was no increase in bleeding patients on aspirin alone. So maybe this is a trial that should be used in patients on aspirin alone, where there was also a larger benefit in ischemic events. So therefore, I think that waropaxar really may reduce cardiovascular death and MI when added to aspirin and <coughs> clopidogrel and ACS. But there is a substantial increase in major bleeding. But similar to rivaroxaban. So although we have other new alternatives like the new P2Y12 inhibitors that will provide the same benefits, this might be a treatment that could be used maybe together with aspirin alone or using other combinations than was tested in the TRACER trial. So thank you for your attention. <coughs>